rummaging, but with very good reason. What I'd like to do in today's video is get right into the back of this really inconveniently placed food cupboard to dig out all of the stuff that's been shoved right to the back that's been in there for God knows how many months. And what I'd really like to do is a pantry challenge stroke daily dozen what I eat in a day. So the first thing I need to do is get the rest of these out from the back of the cupboard so that I can check the dates to make sure that I'm using the one that goes out of date first. Give me a minute. So this is what we're working with. So I do keep a lot of herbs and spices on hand at all times and I do I am pretty good at getting through them all so I do often have a lot of herbs and spices and condiments and things like that in and then we've also got things like grains rice noodles there's pasta at the back in there which you won't be able to see probably and I've got some tofu there some silken tofu uh, so that's kind of what I'm working with spice and flavour wise and then we can see in here got quite a few tins of beans button mushrooms red kidney beans that's the gap that i've rescued all of this banana blossom from and so let's see what we can make with some of that so this is a perfect example of how buying something just because it's on offer can sometimes be false economy. I've ended up with five tins of banana blossom, which I've never tried before. I've never tasted. I've no idea if I like it. But last year, Aldi was selling them off for like 19 pence a tin. So every week when I went and did the shop, I got another tin, another tin, another tin, without trying the first tin to see if I even liked it. So I've ended up with five tins of banana blossom, all of which are going out of date. By the end of this year, luckily it's still quite a long date on them, so they're all pretty much the same date, so I am going to use one of them. Hopefully I will like it and that, that's going to encourage me to use the rest of them in a similar recipe. But I'll be the only one eating this, this isn't something that hubby is going to go for, so I can realistically only get through one tin at a time. But I'm hoping that if I manage to find something really tasty to make with this, it will encourage me to use the rest of them up so they're not gonna go to waste. So that's one of the first ingredients I want to try. I've also realized that it's probably not as easy as I thought to not put any thought into achieving the Daily Dozen because a lot of the other items that I've decided I'm gonna to want to use do actually need a little bit of prep and a little bit of forethought. So things such as quinoa, which I tend to prefer to soak overnight before I eat it, and things such as the tofu, which I will want to also marinate overnight before I use it. So this is like the pre-video, if you will. Uh, so we're gonna get started on marinating and prepping, and we're actually gonna do the eating of the Daily Dozen tomorrow. So let's get started. I have also got this little pantry down here that I forgot to show and I'm probably going to find quite a few things in here that have been in there for a while so I've got some chia seeds there that I'm going to use and some quinoa and quinoa there so just on the first go around the pantry, I've picked out uh, porridge oats, some quinoa, some chia seeds, and uh, the banana blossom. And one thing that I do buy in bulk that doesn't ever go to waste is this, the world's biggest tub of nutritional yeast. Now I use it so frequently that this actually works out really good value for me. For me to buy the, the larger tubs, this, this is 750 gram, you can also buy it in one kilo tubs, which is what I'll be doing when, when this one runs out. It works out about half the price of buying it in the 100 gram tubs that you'll typically get from a health food shop or the supermarket. So if you do use a lot of nutritional yeast, it's very, very common in vegan recipes to give a cheesy umami flavour, then I do definitely recommend that you look out for the large value packs because it is a really good saving. So I'm just gonna fill up a jar, a smaller jar that I keep in the pantry and then this one goes back into storage nice and safe in the garage until I'm ready to top up again. Thank you. 
So that was yesterday when we pulled a few things out of the pantries that we wanted to use and we did a little bit of prep but today's the day we're going to try and put all that together and see if we can actually eat the daily dozen. Now we'll be using some fresh fruit and vegetables as well, they haven't specifically been bought for this challenge, if you're anything like me I'm sure that you gravitate towards buying the same dozen fruits and vegetables week in week out so that's all we've done at the weekend I did a shop just getting in our typical vegetables nothing specifically for these challenges and i'm just going to open up the fridge take a look and see how i can incorporate that into the daily dozen meals for today the first thing i'm going to start on is the quinoa which actually isn't for a main meal it's for a dessert the reason i've done that is because i used quinoa for a main meal in my last daily dozen challenge if you haven't seen that please go check that out i'll leave links around and in the description below uh, so we need to get on with that because that needs time in the oven and it also needs time in the fridge to set so i'm going to get on with that now before breakfast so the recipe i'm trying to recreate is a chocolate covered quinoa bark and the recipe the original recipe that i've gone with is by half baked harvest and the reason i've chosen that amongst all the dozens and dozens of quinoa bark recipes that came up is because that was the only one that specified to rinse the quinoa all of the other recipes were to use the quinoa dry straight out of the packet now i don't know about you but for my digestion that just doesn't sit right i have much better results usually digesting quinoa enjoying and eating quinoa when it's had a really good overnight soak and it's been rinsed so this is the recipe i decided to go with and she does recommend to rinse the quinoa but i've gone the extra step of soaking it overnight and then giving it a really good rinse the only thing that i'm concerned with is in the recipe she does actually say the quinoa should be rinsed and dried but nowhere does she explain how you're supposed to dry wet quinoa which i really have no idea how that would happen i'm assuming she means rinsed and drained so this has had a really good drain over the sink and it does get mixed with some wet ingredients anyway so i'm hoping that it's going to be all right just for low format purposes i just couldn't get on board with using the quinoa dried straight from the packet and i will leave the original recipe down below because i'm going to be making some more modifications to it to make it low fodmap compliant so the recipe asks for two tablespoons of coconut oil so we need to melt this coconut oil now into the syrup so I'm just going to let the residual heat melt the rest of that coconut oil. So to the syrup now, I need to whisk in some vanilla, some coffee granules and some salt. And with your vanilla extract, you do need to be aware of what sweeteners they're using. This is in a glucose syrup, which is actually suitable, surprisingly, for the low FODMAP diet because when we limit fructose it's actually fructose in excess of glucose so glucose syrup in itself is actually not high fodmap and then we're gonna have a grind of salt and i will be using decaf just because that's what my gut prefers but feel free to use whatever oh, that smells amazing This definitely looks too wet. I'm going to add some mixed spice because it's a flavour that I love, particularly in autumn and winter. And I'm thinking, looking at this, because I've 
significantly reduce the amount of nuts that we're going to use in this just to keep one slice low FODMAP. I think I am going to have to use the rest, if not all, of that quinoa. So I'm going here with some flax seeds and I'm not measuring any of this, I'm just eyeballing. You would, of course, be needing to measure this out if you were planning to stick to this being low FODMAP. Flaxseed is obviously a low FODMAP ingredient. It's also a singular ingredient in the Daily Dozen checklist, but I believe it does have a recommended low portion serving. So you would need to be aware of that. So the recipe actually calls for half a cup of almonds, half a cup of cashews and half a cup of mixed raw seeds. But that really is just an awful lot of FODMAPs layered on top of FODMAPs. So I'm not going to include all of those nuts in this version. I am just going to use some pecans that I've got. So and I will actually make a point of weighing those just to make sure that I'm aware of how much is going to be in each serving. And I am going to add now the rest of the quinoa into this because I know that quinoa is a low FODMAP ingredient. Whereas a lot of the other nuts that are recommended in the recipe do have very small low FODMAP servings and they also contain similar FODMAPs. So you're going to be risking FODMAP stacking. And this is hopefully going to make up for all those excess nuts and seeds that we won't be adding to this version. So it actually says that this recipe has 24 servings. That sounds like an awful lot. I'm not sure that with the the lack of extra nuts and seeds in there, I'm not sure this is going to stretch to 24 servings. I think there would be tiny, tiny servings. What I am going to do is I'm going to measure out enough pecans for at least a dozen servings. So we'll say that we've halved it. I'll see how many pecans I've got here because like I say, I'm really not sure how this is going to work out. So I don't want to waste all those pecans as well if this doesn't work. So we're saying 20 grams is one single serving. So let's say 100 grams, which is probably going to be about a cup. So if we go back to the recipe, it was half a cup of cup of almonds, half a cup of cashews. So we've kind of covered that there with a cup of the pecans and then we did some flaxseed, probably only a couple of tablespoons, but we did do the rest of that quinoa, which was at least half a cup, probably closer to three quarters of a cup. So I'm hoping that this is gonna work out. So I'm just gonna give these pecans a little choppy chop. And of course, the benefit to only using 100 grams, which is about the equivalent of five portions, means that we can eat a bigger portion of this if we want. And the benefit of eating a bigger portion of this means that we will be closer to getting a full portion of the grains with the quinoa. If this was split into 24 portions, then that's going to be nowhere near the recommended portion size for the grains, which is why we're using the quinoa in the first place. Uh, we're using it as one of our daily dozen grain portions, but split into 24, that's just not going to be an adequate portion. Oh, and that has really thickened up now. So I think what I'm probably going to do, it doesn't recommend this in the recipe, but just for the sake of trying to make sure that this works as well as it can, I'm probably going to leave that to sit for about half an hour to see if this quinoa will soak up any more of this extra liquid. Of course, the issue is that because I soaked the quinoa overnight, it may have, have reached its capacity as to exactly how much liquid it can absorb. So that's the only issue. Uh, if I'd have simply just rinsed the quinoa this morning, as recommended in the recipe, then this would definitely have absorbed more of this liquid and perhaps that is part of the, the recipe method is that the quinoa will start to absorb some of that liquid whereas mine, mine might not be able to absorb much more liquid. So we'll come back to this in about half an hour. So we've got our overnight oats chia pudding from yesterday. I'm going to be adding some frozen raspberries to that. And um, Frozen raspberries are perfectly acceptable on the Daily Dozen diet. They're perfectly acceptable on the low FODMAP diet. The Daily Dozen recommendation is for half a cup. 
So I'm just going to weigh these out rather than go by cup. For any items that do have a specific low FODMAP serving, I do prefer to weigh them rather than use cup measurements. So we're going to see how many. So 58 grams is the recommended low FODMAP portion size. So that is the recommended low FODMAP portion size for raspberries. And if we try and get it into our cup, and I would say that is pretty much half a cup. So we've fulfilled the berry requirements for the day. So I've got my cute little serving glass here. Now, I think we've used there about a third. And that actually looks good to me. I'm not a huge breakfast eater. I'm actually not a huge fan of chia seeds, hence the fact that we had them left over in the pantry. So I think that looks like enough for me. I'm going to pop those berries on top. And how cute does that look? So that's the first serving of the day of the berries. Quarter of a cup of nuts or seeds. So we've just got a few tablespoons of chia in there. So I'm not going to count that along with the chia that we've got in there and what we're using in the quinoa dessert we've definitely hit our nuts or seeds for the day but i won't take that off until we've done the dessert and then for the whole grains it recommends half a cup of hot cereal or cooked grains or one cup of cold cereal so obviously this isn't a full cup so we've probably only done about half of a whole grain there so so we'll come back to that a bit later when we've added in some more grains that will constitute a full portion. Oh, and I almost forgot that we did actually include uh, a quarter of a teaspoon of turmeric in the mixture, which is why it's that off yellow colour. So I will also tick the herbs and spices for the day. So I'm really pleased to say that the addition of the extra quinoa and just leaving it to sit while I ate my breakfast has soaked up now all of the extra liquid that was in the bottom there, pretty much all of it. So I'm happy to go ahead and get that onto the baking tray and carry on with the rest of the recipe. So we just need to spread this thinly and evenly onto a baking tray. I think I probably could spread this a little thinner if I had a larger tray. So that's going to go in the oven now at 180 Celsius, which I believe is 370 Fahrenheit for about 20 to 25 minutes. Now, I wouldn't say it was crisp, so I'm wondering if it crispens up as it sits. But it does need to set in the fridge. So hopefully that will help with the, the overall texture. So for the chocolate, I opted, just to make it look pretty, I've opted for a vegan dark chocolate and also a vegan white chocolate. If you want to keep things purely low FODMAP, then just stick with the dark chocolate. And um, Because we've estimated that this is probably going to make about 12 portions, then we can times the low FODMAP portion of dark chocolate, which is 30 grams, by 12 portions to make sure that we've got enough chocolate to cover the whole base. So I'm just going to break the chocolate up into these bowls and give it a quick blast 30 seconds at a time in the microwave. That's my honestly preferred method of melting chocolate is in the microwave. I think it's much easier and I find that as long as you're doing it in 30 second increments, you've got quite a, a decent amount of control over it. I think the recipe called for about 340 grams, which I believe when divided by 12 portions actually brings us in under the recommended low FODMAP portion size. So I'm just going to get this weighed. So that comes to just over 100 grams. And I actually only have the two bars. So that's a total of 200 grams. So I am just going to do both of these. I don't have any more chocolate in stock. So the chocolate on the top is going to be a little bit thinner than the recipe recommends. And what I like to try and do, just to make sure that the chocolate doesn't burn, is that I like to try and get it to a stage where the residual heat in the bowl will melt the remainder of the chocolate rather than blasting the chocolate to within an inch of its life 
and risking it burning. Yeah, that seems to be melting into the rest of that chocolate without me having to put it back on the heat. And this actually took two minutes for this particular brand of chocolate. But you really do need to keep an eye on it because it does go from solid to liquid really, really quickly. So you are risking it burning. So there, we've pretty much got all of that melted. So I'm going to start this. I feel confident putting this in for at least a minute now because we know that this one took a minute and a half to two minutes. And then I'll check it after a minute. We've got that to the point where there's enough melted chocolate in there to quite easily melt the rest of that just from the residual heat. And then because I don't have the full amount of chocolate, I don't think that's quite enough to cover the full width of the quinoa bag. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put some of this in. This was only meant to be a drizzle for the top. So I'm going to put that in there. So we've got a bit more chocolate just to go over the complete base so I'm really pleased to say that this has really started to firm up I don't know if you can see that that is actually coming up in like whole sections now that's already much firmer than it was when we first took it out of the oven and I will say that I do think I've probably spread this a little bit thick so that's probably partly my fault as well uh, this side seems to be quite thick so I think if you had a larger tray and you could spread it a little bit thinner then this would crispen up even more so let's get this chocolate on while it's still melted and of course because we are sticking to just what I had in the pantry this hasn't covered the whole base, I didn't think it would. From a low format point of view, we could have added more chocolate, but I just didn't have any. So we're going quite thin on here, but this is a pantry challenge, and that is a realistic view of what I had in stock. So that gets popped into the fridge now for at least a couple of hours. That's going to be our dessert after dinner. And I'm really pleased with that. I actually think that's going to work really, really well. If you're beyond the elimination phase and you know that you tolerate nuts and seeds well, you could add some more chopped nuts to the top. And of course, the absolute best bit about baking is that I get to lick the spoon. So I'm really hungry now. I'm really ready for lunch. That quinoa bark took much longer than I expected it to so I am now looking for a really good filling lunch and something I'm super super excited about is these now uh, they've decided to call them toasting muffins these are probably what you would consider most people would consider to be what they call an English muffin I don't know why do they not have these in the rest of the world but this is an English muffin and the reason I'm mega excited is because last year this was actually introduced into the Monash app. You can have one single English muffin as a low FODMAP portion and typically English muffins are made from white wheat flour which is uh, something that I'm equally excited and quite surprised by because they actually also feature in the Daily Dozen app. Now one full muffin is actually two portions because half a muffin is considered a portion of grains for the Daily Dozen requirements. So a full muffin would actually be considered two portions and I'm probably going to count it as such today. Normally what I would prefer to do is when I've been able to plan the daily dozen menu I like to be able to have a, a big variety so I'd like to have a larger variety but smaller quantities of foods so typically I wouldn't count the same grain as two portions but today I think we're going to need to because of the small amount of oats I ate 
combine that with the small amount of quinoa that I'm going to eat with the dessert I think that probably only just makes up one single portion of grains so I'm going to sneakily get the other two portions of grains by having a whole one whole English muffin and one whole English muffin as I said is considered low FODMAP so let's get on with lunch so this is what our marinated tofu and mushrooms look like from yesterday now the mushrooms that would be two low FODMAP servings and the tofu that would be one serving because tofu is actually considered a bean when it comes to the daily dozen and I'm going to add some tomato and a low FODMAP serving of avocado onto that as well so it's going to be a little bit like a tofu BLT a TLT and once again because I don't believe it's the devil I am going to use a little splash of oil in the pan if you do oil free then you do you but that's going to help this to cook a bit more evenly and probably a little bit quicker which is the name of the game at the minute because i am hungry i am going to cook all of the mushrooms but i will only be eating half to keep it low fodmap and i have noticed that canned mushrooms champignons however you call them they do tend to stick quite a lot because they do have quite a high water content even though we pressed as much of that liquid out yesterday as we could so do be aware that they do get quite spitty and I'm also going to add in my spinach so I don't know about you but for me an English muffin always has to be toasted so that's what I've done here I'm actually going to add a little bit of rocket as well. Um, this is not going to constitute a full portion, but that is part of a portion of our cruciferous veggies. And I'll probably add another half portion into my evening meal. And I'm going to start layering up the tomatoes, some of the mushrooms. And this is going to be fully loaded. I perhaps should have put that on the side, but let's go for it. Spinach. And just to top it off, a low FODMAP portion of avocado. Wow. If that's not fully loaded, I don't know what is. Well, how about that? Not only is that absolutely delicious looking, but it's low FODMAP and it fulfills the requirements of the daily dozen. Now, I'm not even gonna to attempt to eat this on camera because it's gonna be positively feral, but I'm just gonna go away and enjoy this and then I'll come back to you when it's ready to start tea. Oh, So that was every bit as messy and delicious as it looked. I probably should have put half of that tofu on the side, maybe chopped it up into a lettuce cup or something. It would have been much more ladylike, but I absolutely demolished it and I really, really enjoyed it. And I hope it goes to show you that you can really eat filling, satisfying, really delicious, tasty looking food and keep it both low FODMAP and have it be within the daily dozen guidelines. So speaking of which, we didn't tick off what we've just eaten for lunch, so I'm going to try and tick that off now and I'll show you where I think we're at. So we've eaten one of our bean portions with the tofu. I'm going to take a liberty here and I'm going to mark the small portion of avocado and the small portion of tomato as a single fruit portion. For the cruciferous vegetables, if I just go on to the information, rocket or arugula for my american friends is included again that was only a small portion it should be um, half a cup chopped there wasn't half a cup on there but i am going to add some into my evening meal later on so i'll tick off the cruciferous vegetables then for the greens we have the spinach and that did equate to about half a cup cooked which is either half a cup cooked or one cup raw so we did get about half a cup cooked so i will i will count that as a green other vegetables 
we have the mushrooms and the whole grains and then just to show you that I'm really not making this up to suit my own agenda uh, here we have that half a bagel or an English muffin is considered one of your whole grain servings so I am going to take a liberty there with that and I am going to count that that full muffin as two whole grain servings of course I am drinking water throughout the day I'm just not ticking it off I've probably had the equivalent between the plain water and herbal teas that I drink I probably had the equivalent of maybe two and a half three cups so I'll pop that onto there so you can see that we're doing pretty well we've still got two lots of beans and we're going to achieve that in our evening meal the fruits uh, we're going to achieve with a snack and an evening meal. The cruciferous vegetables, we've had half a portion. We're going to have the other half in the, in the main meal. The greens, again, we're going to try and hit that with the evening meal. The other vegetables we're going to hit with the evening meal. And the flax seeds, the nuts and the seeds. And our other whole grains are actually in our snack, which we've not yet tried. And I'm actually just going to eat this kiwi fruit as a snack. So do you eat yours with a spoon like it's a dessert or do you tend to slice it up and peel it? I know some people actually eat them with the skin on, just can't bring myself to do that. And I'm pretty sure that the low FODMAP values have been calculated without the skin because that is a lot of fibrous roughage. One to two kiwis is considered a low FODMAP portion and that's quite a sizeable kiwi. So I'm going to count that as one of my daily dozen fruit portions. So I just wanted to show you that this bark turned out so much better than I thought it was going to. This has had a couple of hours in the fridge and it has completely solidified. It's a bit sticky on the paper but that is one just huge piece of quinoa bark. And I'm probably not going to be eating this until much later on when the, the light has completely gone. So I just wanted to show you how it looks now. The recipe does say to break it up, but I want to be a bit more strategic than that. Just so that I know we're not overeating on some of the higher FODMAP ingredients. Whoa. That is perfect. So that's crisped up. Completely now on that side. Chocolate solidified. So it probably would have looked prettier if I'd snapped it up into shards, but that is what we're dealing with. And the original recipe did say 24 portions. At a 24th of a portion, you'd be looking at about half that, which I think is a little bit on the scrimping side. I think that is probably much closer to what I would assume is a full portion. And Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and that is a low, uh, also a low FODMAP portion for this recipe. Mm, 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 mm. That is really good. So it's quite early; it's about twenty past four. But I am going to start to get on with doing the recipes for the evening meal, just because we are rapidly, rapidly losing any kind of natural light. This is what it looks like in my kitchen at four pm. Welcome to filming in winter in the north of England. So we do need the artificial light. So let's get on to the backbone of the main meal. I'm hoping that the banana blossom is going to be the star of the show. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to batter that and air fry it like a version of vegan fish. I've seen lots and lots of recipes for this. That's the main reason I bought so many tins of this banana blossom. Never tasted it, never tried it, never touched it, never even seen it out of the can in real life. I've only seen photographs of it online and it does look amazing, but all of those recipes do tend to deep fry it. I'm going to actually try and batter it. I'd still like it to be battered just to give me that fish, um, that fish experience, but I'm also going to try and do it in the air fryer. So I've no idea how that's going to work. Complete experiment. Then to go with that for my carbs, I'm going to have a celeriac and cannellini bean mash. It is something I've had before and I do really enjoy it. So this celeriac is pretty gnarly looking and it is going a bit soft. It has been in the fridge for over a week now so that definitely needs using. 
The cannellini beans were a new addition last year into the Monash app and I think they have quite a decent serving size and I am going to be making enough of the mash to last me for two days so I will be doubling up on what's considered a low FODMAP serving. Then to go along with that I'm going to be having some, instead of mushy peas, I'm going to have some edamame beans which are again have a decent generous low FODMAP serving size and I'm going to kind of make those into like a mushy pea or a garden pea substitute. You can have canned garden peas on the low FODMAP diet but I'm not overly keen on them. So this is what we're working with to form the basis of our vegan fish. And you can see how that could look quite fish like. I'm not quite sure how I feel about the look of that. That does look really quite animal. Almost kind of like gills or... Mm, I'm really not sure how I feel about that. I can see where the idea of the fish texture comes from with these layers. I can see that. I'm just not sure about all these little weird gill bits, but that's what we're working with. So I'm going to treat this the way that I would jackfruit in that I'm going to rinse off as much of the flavour from the canning liquid as possible. I'm going to try getting these layers as well. So now that I'm actually getting to grips with this banana blossom and realising how much like jackfruit it is, I kind of wish that I'd prepared this yesterday when I was doing some of the other prep, but never mind, we're going to do our best with it. So what I really want to do is try and flavour this up now, because as with jackfruit, it does have a very sweet, sour, almost a fermented fruit type flavour which we've got rid of some of by giving it a good rinse but I do want to now try and, and tamper that down so first thing I'm going to hit this with some lemon juice quite a generous squeeze get some sea salt on I'm going to add a little bit of Old Bay seasoning this isn't an a incredibly popular seasoning here in the UK it is something you can get in the supermarkets but it's quite expensive and it's nowhere near as popular as it is in the US. But I do know that it is often used to season fish dishes and seafood. So I thought it would be a good option for this dish. And I don't really get the opportunity to use it a lot. Because as I say, it's not really a popular seasoning here in the UK. So I thought that would be a good way to use some of that up. And then you're going to want to avoid this if you're in the elimination phase of the low FODMAP diet. But I'm also going to hit this with a teaspoon of dried kelp powder. And that's going to get that fishy, seaweed, seafood aroma going into here. It's not the most appetising of colours, but and I'm hoping that when you actually get a bite into a cross section, you're probably not going to pick up as much on the greeny greyness of this. This might be a step too far for some people who tend to eat with their eyes but so for the dredge I'm gonna do a quarter a quarter cup of ooh, corn flour a quarter cup of gluten free plain or all purpose for my American friends flour and I really have no idea if this is the right amount I'm just playing this by ear I'm going to put a little bit of white pepper in there some smoked sea salt and just for a bit of that umami I'm going to add some nutritional yeast to that I'm going to add some sparkling spring water That was a quarter cup. I'm probably just going to do a touch more. I'm going to leave it at that. So I just did a whole section of peeling and weighing the celeriac and the camera wasn't 
filming so I'll just recap again here just to say that I was hoping to be able to use a quarter of the celeriac for each individual portion I am going to make two portions and when I've weighed these each one of these portions weighs about 150 grams which is double the low FODMAP recommended serving size of 75 grams the reason I'm not too concerned about that is because I tolerate mannitol really well and it doesn't become moderate for mannitol until 350 grams which would be the entire half of the celeriac so that would be for both both servings so I'm quite happy with that if you're in the elimination phase then obviously stick to the 75 grams which for a celeriac of this size would be half so it would be an eighth of the entire celeriac which is not going to give you an awful lot but for me this is going to make two portions that's just so that I know that the rest of this isn't going to go to waste hubby won't eat this and I'm now at the point in my low FODMAP journey where I can prioritise minimising food waste rather than minimising certain types of FODMAPs so I'm going to get this chopped up and ready in the steamer So I'm going to steam that until it's softened. So now the cali beans have been rinsed and drained. I'm going to weigh out two low FODMAP portions because I'm making enough mash for two days. And that will be 150 grams. So we do have quite a generous serving size, the cannellini beans. There we are. And for my American friends, I reckon that's probably going to be about a cup. Yeah, a scant cup. So with the cannellini beans we've got another portion of our beans, with the banana blossom we've got our final portion of fruit, the other vegetables we've got our portion of celeriac and um, because I've decided I really don't like the natural flavour of the banana blossom so I'm going to somehow try to attach some of these nori sheets I've had this nori in the cupboard for ages so I'm quite happy to just use up the rest of it and I believe this would also count towards our daily dozen vegetable requirements. So I might just try and put a little bit of the dredge and then see if we can stick that to there I think the issue with that is that we're not going to get it to look the way that a lot of these images are looking online because we're not going to see all the texture of those flakes of the banana blossom there's probably a much more delicate way of doing this but that nori is softening up in the dredge which does help it to mould a little bit better around the banana blossom still not giving the shape that I was originally looking for but I think it is going to improve the flavour and I am all about the flavour I know a lot of people eat with their eyes but I would much rather something was delicious than beautiful that is softening up, it is wrapping round, it's just really really messy and I've no idea how that is going to hold together in the air fryer. I can definitely see why pretty much all of the recipes I come across online, this was deep fried. Because when you get that batten, that oil nice and hot, that is going to pretty much seal together as soon as it hits the batter. I have no idea if or how that is going to work in the air fryer. Final piece, and um, that's another pantry item that has been in there staring at me in the back of the pantry for a long time that's another one of my pantry items used up so I'm actually going to make some homemade tartar sauce I'm going to use a um, soya sugar free yoghurt base just because this is what I have open and what I have to hand if you're low FODMAP then you would need to use a low FODMAP approved coconut yoghurt and I'm really eyeballing these I'm not measuring once again if you were in the elimination phase of a low FODMAP diet then you would need to measure some of these although the coconut yogurt does have a really generous serving. We've got some gherkins also known as dill pickles for my American friends. These are leftover from Christmas so I'm going to finely chop some of those into it. 
and again these do have a low FODMAP serving size they're listed in the Monash app under gherkins I think they do have quite a generous serving normally you would use capers in a tartar sauce but I happen to have these these are my homemade they're called poor man's capers but they're actually nasturtium pods so these are actually fermented nasturtium pods from my garden that I've grown myself you wouldn't use these if you're in the elimination phase because they haven't been tested by Monash they're not included in the app you could stick to capers capers do have a low FODMAP serving size and you don't need many of these because they are really really fiery they really do pack a punch they're almost like a cross between wasabi and maybe rocket or a radish or something something quite peppery and fiery they do mellow out a little bit when they've been fermented but that is a great way to use those up because they've been hanging around in the fridge for quite some time next up is a big handful of this fresh parsley which is looking quite sorry for itself I'm just going to give that a quick wash. I do chop the parsley stalks in as well because I don't mind the kind of woodiness of them. I almost think they're a little bit similar to chives but you can just do the leaves if you prefer just to keep it a little bit more aesthetic and a little less fibrous. And then I'm just going to finish off with a squeeze of lemon. And a tiny pinch of white pepper and a tiny grind of salt. It really doesn't need a lot. So that is my chunky herbaceous tartar sauce. So it's a couple of days later and I've sat down to edit the footage and realised I didn't even do an outro for the end of the video. I was really frazzled by the end of a full day filming. I really wasn't happy with how that final recipe turned out. The lighting was terrible and I just kind of gave up there in the end. So I just wanted to come back today and share some of my thoughts on the Daily Dozen Pantry Challenge. Um, things that I thought went well and things that I'd probably do different again next time. With regards to the Daily Dozen Challenge, regardless of, of what I personally ate, regardless of what was in my pantry, that is going to be different for everybody. Uh, as I did mention in the intro, I do tend to have a better stocked pantry than most people, especially with things like herbs and spices, uh, canned goods, dried goods. So I do tend to have a, a fairly well stocked pantry all the time. Having said that, I also work on a really, really small budget. So if you take anything away from this challenge, I hope that it would be that you, you realise that it is possible to work towards the full daily dozen requirements and not need to have to go out and spend a fortune at the local farmer's market, at Whole Foods, 
to not need to, to really have to overstretch your budget in order to be able to, to eat well. So I really hope that seeing things like the canned fruit, the frozen fruit, the, the canned beans and things like that, that, that not only do you realise that you can actually make use of what you already have or potentially it would already have in stock in the pantry, but also that you can do it on a on a on an average budget, shopping at a regular supermarket, uh, shopping within your within your means, um, and I really hope that's something that you can take away. And also that you don't have to be doing everything from scratch. You, you know you can make use of of some convenience and something that's quick easy and to be to be perfectly honest that is probably the way that you are going to stick to this the most rather than tell yourself that you have to all of a sudden completely overhaul the way that you prep food the way that you store food the the way that you use your pantry the way that you use your budget if you can try and make these changes incrementally with what you have available to you whether that be time whether that be money whether that be space and I really hope that that is the one thing that you do take away from this video. So from the pantry element, I thought that was really successful. I'm really pleased that I managed to get some stuff pulled from the back, things that I've been kind of avoiding eye contact with for quite a while that I know have been there for, for a while and I've needed to use up and they keep getting pushed back and back and back into the pantry. So from, from that point of view for me, I thought that was really successful. To bring those foods out, to realise that I actually did quite like the banana blossom and that I could see the potential in how I could use it in future recipes so I know that the other cans in there are not going to go to waste. For using up odds and sods that were open like the bits of corn flour and quinoa and the sushi nori sheets that have been in there forever and I just never got around to using so little things like that were a big success for me. So put all that together now with the low FODMAP diet and for anybody that is doing the low FODMAP diet and does want to try and, and work towards the daily dozen principles, um, there are a couple of observations. Firstly, I do think that it is quite difficult to get the full amount of fruit portions without doing some little hacks. Now I say hacks, the, the way that I did it in, in this video using the fruit as a savoury item. It is still fruit, it was, it was in a tin, but just because I didn't eat it like fruit, I didn't eat it like a dessert, it is still actually considered a fruit. So it wasn't a cheat, but I do think that, especially from a low FODMAP point of view, um, the guidelines are for one portion of berries and for three portions of fruit. That is a lot of fruit to eat on the low FODMAP diet. Generally you're recommended two servings a day and you're also recommended to try and split those servings up so that you're not eating more than one full serving of fruit in one sitting. So to eat three pieces of fruit plus berries as well as everything else that you're supposed to be eating and leaving plenty of time in between for your digestion to do its thing I do think is quite tricky. So for my friends on the low FODMAP diet I do think using some kind of hacks like I did where you're actually looking at things such as tomatoes, avocados, things like the banana blossom, possibly jackfruit and you're looking at using them in a more savoury way. You're looking at using them as part of a main meal, as part of a savoury meal, as part of a snack rather than looking, looking at them as fruit on a breakfast or fruit as a snack or fruit as a dessert. I do think you're going to struggle to fit to fit in for essentially four portions of fruit and still keep things low FODMAP and still keep your gut in check. So that was one of the biggest observations for me. Again, when it comes to the beans section, I do think that it's possible for you to get a variety, but not necessarily the quantity. Things such as tofu, tempeh, edamame and the cannellini beans that I use, they all have quite generous servings, but that's about it. Um, for the rest of the beans, legumes on the low FODMAP diet, they're all considered high FODMAP foods, or at least moderately high in FODMAPs. So again, for those, you wouldn't necessarily be able to have three portions at half a cup each time. Uh, the only way you po possibly could do that is if you ate uh, tofu at one meal, tempeh at another meal and edamame at another meal and that would be three, you'd be able to get three half cup portions there. 
but if you are using other beans then you are going to struggle and it, then it becomes that you're not eating three half cup portions of beans you would then have to be looking at eating six quarter cup portions of beans so for anybody that does have an intolerance to soy and they can't make use of the more generous serving sizes of tofu, tempeh and edamame, I do think you are going to struggle and you are really going to have to plan efficiently to get five or six smaller portions of beans in throughout the day and you would be having, looking at having to use them maybe in different ways of maybe adding them into soups, maybe adding them into sauces, blitzing them up into dips, even eating them somehow in your breakfast, possibly including them in, in desserts, maybe like uh, bl uh, blending them into a mousse or something like that. You are probably going to have to think out of the box to get in the full quantity but again it isn't about being perfect, it's about gradually and slowly and incrementally building up, building up and working towards a goal. It isn't about doing it perfectly right out of the bat and I know that I did manage to get everything ticked off which is a big achievement but as I say that is because I eat very very liberally now. There are very few things that I still eat at a low FODMAP serving size but that has taken me years to build up almost a tolerance to the FODMAPs that I was previously sensitive to and I've just I built up gradually and gradually gradually retested myself repushed myself and that is where I'm at now if you are in the elimination phase or the beginning phases of a low FODMAP diet then you you don't have that information to hand and that really isn't something that you should be pushing for at that stage because that is possibly going to be a detriment to the information that you need to find out for yourself in those elimination phases uh, I do think that you are probably going to be more effective if you do plan ahead so things like you saw me soaking my quinoa I know some people prefer to soak or sprout any nuts or seeds before they use them some people like to even soak um, porridge oats before they use them uh, things like marinating tofu tofu can be very dull so it is good to get that marinade going the night before so again the whilst it's not impossible to just wake up one day and decide you're going to aim for it don't be too disheartened if you don't get there because it, it can take a bit of fore planning and it, and it does take a little bit of of thinking slightly differently about what's going on your plate which of course that is entirely the point of it I think when you are being more mindful you are much more likely to, to get closer to the goal of the full daily dozen because you're starting to look at things differently and you actually look where you can fit in can I fit in another vegetable? Can I fit in some more greens? Can I fit in an extra piece of fruit here, there and everywhere? So it, just being that little bit mindful rather than just deciding off the cuff that you're going to do it, I think is definitely more likely to be more productive and to get you a little bit closer to hitting all the complete targets and last but not least the app you must download the app it is so it's free to use it's free to download there's no upsell within the app uh, it's very simple it's just those simple check boxes that you saw it's all pretty much on, on one or two pages and then there is the option to go in for a little bit more information to give you examples of the types of food in the bean the grain the vegetables the greens the cruciferous vegetable category gives you the, um, some examples of what what you could choose in that category and also gives you the recommended portion sizes which again like I say is is something to aim for particularly on the low FODMAP diet not necessarily the be all and end all so I really hope that you enjoyed this video if you haven't seen my other daily dozen video please do check that out and I would like to make more of these videos they do seem to be really popular so please let me know if it is something else if it is something you would like to see again in the future I am thinking that next time I would like to do a pantry challenge and just open up my pantry and see what we've got as opposed to the way that I did it this time where I actually planned out and prepped some ingredients. I would like to see how feasible it is to do where it's completely off the cuff. This is what I'm working with today. So if that's something you're interested in seeing, please leave a comment in the description box below. As always, I really appreciate all of your likes, comments and interactions and I'll speak to you all soon. Bye.